Thank you for staying with us. Gone are the days where mental health was underrated, and now it is being taken seriously, with a number of persons having breakdowns and committing suicides. According to the Association of Psychiatrists in Nigeria, more than 60 million Nigerians are suffering from some form of mental illness, such as depression, anxiety, autism, amongst others. The World Health Organization also says Nigeria has the highest suicidal rate among the African countries. The theme for this year's World Mental Health Day is Mental Health is a Universal Human Right, which is an opportunity for individuals and communities to come together to deal with mental health issues and the burdens that come with it. We have two mental health advocates with us. In the studio, we have Ayodeji Michael Uni. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And uh, we also have uh, a psychotherapist and mental health advocates uh, joining us via Zoom. Uh, that is uh, Dr. Maimuna Kaderi. Good morning, doctor. Thank you for joining us. Morning. <laughs> Happy World Mental Health Day to all Nigerians and everybody globally. Uh, same to you. Now, let me begin with you, uh, Dr. Kaderi. This matter of, uh, let me begin with the theme, talking about human rights when it comes to mental health. Uh, if you recall, Nigeria began in 1991 with the mental health policy in trying to address this matter of rights to the mental health. And then it kept, you know, trying to improve on it up until 2013, where we also had the, the Mental Health Act reintroduced. I want to understand how far we have come with trying to achieve this matter of mental health rights with all of the laws we have tried to put in place to addressing the gaps that we have had as a country. Have we made progress? Yes, I would say that. And I'm saying yes with so much boldness and way, um, if I want to put it in a Nigerian context, with my full chest because um, beginning of this year, um, the past administration passed the mental health bill into an act, uh, which is a big, big um, change in the mental health space. Uh, because without an act, there, there, there's only a layer we can do, and we can't do so much without laws in place that will propel us to where we are going. And what is that act helping us to do? Um, it's one thing to have an act, it's another thing for implementation and execution. But at least we have laws that are backing us. It then means that all Nigerians, our mental health is now a priority, which wasn't there before. And that also tells us that the, the Lunacy Act of 1959, which we have been using, has been outdated over a hundred years now, and which we are still you know, which we're still using up until this act came in. And what is this act going to do for us? What it's going to do is that it's taking away some of those derogatory statements like lunatic, lunatic idiocy, you know, making it look as if, you know, the moment, the moment you have a mental health each challenge, then you, you, you are a lunatic, you are an idiot, you should be banished to an institution, you should be taken away, your properties should be sold to take care of your mental health, you do not have access to your care, you do not have um, um, your fundamental human rights are violated. And so you can see that in tandem with the current um, theme for the year, which is mental health is a universal human right, that came you know, in a good perspective and is aligning with the theme of the year. So this just means that our act, which has been passed into law, you know, is also in, uh, aligning with the theme for, theme for the year, meaning that if you have a mental health challenge, it doesn't mean that your, your human rights should be violated. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have access to affordable, um, um, accessible, and of course, quality and um, high, uh, quality mental health care. And it shouldn't be that you should not be part of your mental health treatment. So um, for this, uh, we have made tremendous you know, um, you know, um, um, change, and of course, we are looking forward to you know implementation and execution, which is uh, and that is what I would like to still take up with you, Dr. Kadri, because there will be those who say that yes, we have made progress on paper, but uh, if there is no implementation, can we necessarily call that making progress? Yes, it's progress, 
Because the truth is that we can never come together as stakeholders. We cannot sit down as uh, mental health professionals in the ecosystem to take decisions without laws, without an act. And that is the phase where we are in now. As the mental health professionals in this space, what we are doing now is have meetings, stakeholders meeting, you know, um, um, ensuring that all the state government buy into this law, um, this act, and of course, integrating mental health into the primary healthcare system. That is one of the biggest things we need to do. And of course, this current dispensation, is part of the act is to set up a mental health commission. And we are looking at, you know, the president, um, Ahmed Bola Tinubu setting that up soon. Because we can see committees are springing up every, you know, every other day. So we're also looking forward to the mental health commission be set up and all the stakeholders brought in to, to be able to um, sit down, um, discuss this, implement and properly execute. We know this thing, it's not only the mental health act, every other act that Nigeria has ever had, it takes time. We know it's going to take time, but we are all set in ensuring that this happens. All right, let me bring you to the studio, you know, to start with um, IODG, Michael O'Neill, you know, having your own um, you know, uh, perspective to, to these, you know, professional perspective to these. Just like um, Dr. Maimuna Kadiri said, that when people talk about mental health, they usually think um, maybe the person is lunatic or, you know, et cetera. But I, I wanted to help us, you know, understand how much of awareness uh, has, it been create, has been created, you know, for mental health, for people to understand, and what exactly are the hallmarks of good men mental health? All right, thank you very much. So just like Dr. Kadri said, the awareness is building up, mm -hmm. really, because, um, I mean, there has been the issue of mental health a long time ago, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not being seen in the light with which we are seeing it now. Now, people are not seeing mental health now in the light of something is wrong with me, there's a disorder. Before people know that something is wrong, but they cannot place it. But these days we can place it and attribute it to mental health. So I can say we're doing well with the awareness. But just like she also said, it's another thing to know that something is wrong. It's another thing to know how to deal with it. Mm. So now people know they are aware, and it's also been misconstrued now because everybody has mental health issues um, because there's stress everywhere. Everybody has it? Yeah. <laughs> everybody <laughs> has. No, I'm saying that everybody says they have. Okay. Everybody has mental health because there's stress. Every and stress is not a mental health issue. Mm. Yes, stress is not a mental health issue. So the awareness is really, really gradually building up. But we can do better. Mm. We can do better because there's still a lot of people, especially in this cultural setting that we found ourselves. A lot of these things that we call mental health issue or the people call spiritual issues, cultural issues, are not issues like that. They are actually mental health issues. So while we say the awareness is building up, we still have to go to the grassroots mm. to let people know that what they think they are dealing with is not actually what they are dealing with. They are dealing with mental health disorders, and these things are real. Because, because there are traditional centers that uh, address that people carry these people to, to help them deal with these issues. Some carry them to uh, religious homes to say, okay, you know, deal with this issue. Because I recall, I did a report uh, some years ago where I saw some persons going for alternative treatment. And uh, these persons were chained, you know, to the ground, chained in all sorts of ways, dehumanizing them, so to speak. And I'm wondering, how we are taking this message to people in that space on managing persons that have health challenges that people who may not be aware of, okay, the resources they have, the rights they have, you know, to, you know, going to some uh, homes to addressing this matter, deciding to go to such alternative centers. I don't know if we are taking the messages there. Yeah, that, that's where I'm going to. So it's not just about coming on here like this mm. to talk about these things. You see, the people that are really dealing with these things are the people that are not so educated. Yeah. The non-educated people. The educated people already know this. Where they have the go. knowledge. They know where to go. They can visit the psychiatrist. They can visit a psychotherapist because they are learned. But there are these people that don't even have this understanding. And the next thing, the next place they go is to go see a spiritualist. It's to go tell the person, you know what, I think something is wrong with me. I'm having nightmares. I'm dealing with insomnia. They cannot sleep. They don't know that what they are dealing with is insomnia. Mm. 
They do not know that it's schizophrenia. They do not know that it's bipolar disorder. They do not know that it's attention deficit hypersensitive disorder. They do not know that they are dealing with psychosis. So the next thing is they go see a spiritualist, and the next thing is they start chanting things, invoking things, and it becomes more complicated. Mm -hmm. So the awareness needs to be taken to the grassroots. You know, for instance, some time ago, we went to the market. Yeah. And we were telling these market women these things, and it just sounded so absurd to them, like mental health. No, 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 that's, that's insanity. It means that we are, the person is mad. No, you don't have to, you know, be labeled mad when you come out to say that you're dealing with mental. So at that level, the awareness has to be taken to the grassroots level where these people are not out of this knowledge of the mental health we're right. talking about. D Dr. Kadri, let me come to you on Zoom. Um, we, we, uh, we've been talking about the issue of um, the, let's bring it to one of the reality, the, the cases we've seen. Mobad, for instance, you know, we had the, the issue that surrounded his death, you know, before his death and all really? of that. Some people said, you know, it was due to mental health. Help us understand. We've seen all, other videos of some who plunged themselves into uh, Lagoon, mm -hmm. uh, some who also jumped into, onto moving vehicles and all of that. Could it be said that someone who is broke, or, you know, the triggers of mental health, someone who is broke can have mental health issues or is it, you know, help us understand because it's still quite, you know, evasive, you know, for one to be able to put, you know, exact In perspective. Exactly, to, to, to it. Good question. Um, the truth is that um, with every, with you people on, in the studio, with myself here, with every other person who is watching, listening to us, and the over 8 billion people here on earth, no one, absolutely no one, is immune to having a mental challenge. Nobody has immunity. Vaccines have been developed to take care of COVID-19, which was just a, a recent pandemic. But there's no even vaccine in the incubator that is there that will say, okay, when the vaccine comes out, we are going to use it to take care of mental health challenges. So including myself as a neuropsychiatrist that is aware I have no absolute immunity when it comes to mental health challenges. And so that aside, now let's bring it home. But the fact that no one has absolute immunity, and of course there's no vaccine to take your mental health, that means anyone can have a mental health problem at any point in time in their lives. In fact, the World Health Organization has stated that one in eight person is currently living with a mental health challenge. One in eight. So look at it for the eight billion people on earth. If we have one in eight that's currently living with mental health challenge. So how many people are living with mental health challenges right now? And now the depression, which is a lead, which is one of the major you know, um, mental health disorder, is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Meaning that if you have depression, the fact that there are a lot of things you cannot do, activities of daily living, your ability to, to um, have your bath, ability to sleep well, ability to interact with people, ability for you to be productive and fruitful, ability to, for you to execute your activities of daily living will be highly limited. So we have a number of people working in corporate organization, working in schools, working in religious organization that are depressed, that are not productive. When it comes to a mobile case, right, we've discussed extensively of what, what it is, or maybe he had a mental health challenge, but the truth is that he was never clinically diagnosed. I'm not aware of it. I have no colleagues who said that he was clinically diagnosed. It is spe speculation. But even if he had a mental health-related issue, look at all the videos, all the online information we had. With all the harassment, bullying that he experienced, Anyone could have a mental challenge, which is, of course, not exclusive of, of him. So that could pose as a, you know, a, as a risk factor for somebody like him mm -hmm. to have a mental challenge. And let's not forget, he was an entertainer, a musician, which is also a high risk as a celebrity for, for somebody like him to you know, be uh, exposed or more at risk of a mental challenge because of the expectation, you know, what we want him to do, even if it's against his values, it's against his... Um, you know, um, the, the person, personality, the expectation on, on what we want him to be could have also posed him to that. So the truth is that when it comes to mental health challenge, right now over 60 million Nigerians are dealing with mental health challenges, 15 to 29 years of age, uh, suicide is the fourth leading cause of death among that age group. 
Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Nigerians, less than 10% of us, still have access to mental health care. Because the health insurance is not really there covering less than 10% of Nigerians. So out of pocket payment is still up to 70% that Nigerians have to, you know, bring up, use their money to take care of themselves. So, so all these things are challenges that we are dealing with. And we cannot take it away that some of us are already predisposed to having mental health challenge. For the fact that we are coming from homes where there was divorce, coming from home, homes where there was death of one of both parents, coming from a home where there was domestic um, violence, coming from homes where there's positive history of mental health challenge. We have to understand our risk factors. And that means that some of us are already sitting on the fence. Any little thing can easily tempt us to having a mental health challenge, which could be stress. Interesting. Which could be financial. Interesting. Let's bring the conversation back to the studio now. I want us to expatiate on this matter of risk factors that she mentioned, especially for those within the bracket of 15 to 29 years who are said to carry the burden of uh, this matter of health, mental health challenges. Doctor, was what are the risk factors? These people, one would say, I do not necessarily have a responsibility mm. that could bring them under the weight of a mental health challenge. So why are they burdened so much with this matter of uh, mental health? Okay, so let me take it from parenting. Mm. That's the bottom line. Parenting is number one um, factor that exposes people to mental health issues. Now you just talked about this younger generation there's no burden. There's, I mean, there's, there's, there's necessarily no expectations as such from them. Right. But you know, because of where they are coming from, and I always like to focus on the why factor. Okay. Why? Why are they doing what they are doing? It's not about what they are doing. I mean, as a psychotherapist, I get to have sessions with a lot of people, and I get to, I, I, I discovered that it's not basically what they are doing, but it's how or why they are, doing. they are doing what they are doing. Mm. Now, the moment you're able to deal with the why, the what is being defeated. Mm. So there's a lot of parental factors. I mean, parents are failed. You have a lot of parents that are even supporting their children doing some certain things, not knowing that these things would come back to, to them. To haunt them. To haunt them. You know, so it's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle. A mother or a father that has been damaged will breed a child that is being damaged. The child will also go to school to damage another person. I mean, in a school that I wouldn't mention, I heard that a boy in SS1, you know, took some people from the class to um, a nearby hotel to teach them how to smoke drugs, add drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is a child that has been damaged from home. If you check that child, I'm not about what the child did. I'm about why the child did that. Mm -hmm. How did he get to that level? So it's from a damaged home, you know, so something is wrong somewhere. So I take it from that. Then the second factor that is also very important is expectation. She mentioned it. Mm. There's a lot of expectations from this society. From, from the yes. age of 15 to 29? The expectations I'm talking about is from the society. Right. Yes, it's from the society. Now, I heard also about a teacher in a school, you know, so I go to schools, and the teacher was asking the child, how come you don't have a phone? Mm. How come you don't have a phone? Your friends have phones. Your, your friends are using for something. And in SS2. So we've, we've, we've bodied ourselves with some expectations that are not even visible. Mm. You know, so these are factors that exposes us to unnecessary mental health breakdown and disorders. And I can tell you categorically that these young chaps are going through a lot. Mm. They are going through so much that is even much more than what their parents have exposed them to. So I tell parents, if you are exposing your child to anything, be ready to get it 101% back mm. because they will do much more. Where are the consequences? Of course. There are so many consequential effects. So that is another you know, um, not, um, factor. Then we have the social factor, the social media. Mm. Oh, my God. The social media has exposed a lot of these young chaps to terrible things, terrible things. You don't, want to, you don't want to know the things that are obtainable out there. An 11-year-old boy was caught taking a drug. Mm -hmm. And he said it's because he wants to be able to think straight when he gets to church. Mm -hmm. So think straight. Straight. And he was told that taking drugs Makes was the way to go. Think straight. 
Wow. Yeah, I have a client that told me that the reason why I'm he started... Not thinking straight, going to school, but thinking straight... Going to, church. going to church. That's quite uh, paradoxical. Yes. So you, you can imagine the things that are happening out there because it's been from the number one factor that I mentioned, which is parenting. Mm -hmm. Which is parenting. Why would a child think that how to think straight is when he or she takes drugs? But there are those who will say that um, they may have laid the right foundation for their children, but because... They don't follow them everywhere. They don't have to be there with them in schools, wherever they're hanging out with, with their friends. So they don't necessarily know what their children are doing. How, how do you address that aspect? Well, that's where the social factor comes in. But I can tell you, I can tell you that if a child is being well brought up from the home front, see, there's a tendency to want to break away. We've been there. Mm -hmm. So now you find your way back you find your way back. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kaderi, uh, I, I would like to know, you know, sometimes, especially when it is found that um, someone is suffering from mental, mental health challenges, uh, I want to know whether treatment and therapy cure all mental health cases. In, in case it doesn't, what other strategies do you as an expert, you know, deploy to ensure that, or employ to ensure that someone is cured of, you know, these challenges? Um, it's imperative for everyone to understand that mental health disorders, mental health challenges, mental health diseases, mental illnesses are all part of what we call medical diseases, medical disorders, medical challenges. They are not a separate entity when it comes to medical conditions. It's imperative that we understand that. And with that, it's also important for us to know that most Mental and uh, medical conditions are treatable. They are not curable. For example, we can't have we been able to cure malaria. Because it's good for us to lay this foundation so that people will not go mm -hmm. away with the wrong ideas. So with this um, foundation that I've laid, mental conditions are treatable, they are beatable, they are manageable. They are not curable like many other me uh, me uh, medical conditions. And it is also important for us to understand that one of the myths when it comes to mental health condition is that when you have, once you have a mental health condition, you will always have a mental health No, no, it, it is a, it's a myth, it's not a fact. The, the, the thing is that when you have a mental health condition, it could be mild, it could be moderate, it could be severe. So it's a spectrum. The fact that you have lost a loved one, that you are going through grief, and you may not be able to manage it. And at that point in time, if you have grief counselor, you have grief uh, counseling, and with time you become okay, you, you, are, you, know, you can function and everything is all right. You could have anxiety disorder, you could have depression. So they are treatable, they are manageable and beatable. And so where do we come in here when it comes to treatment? Treatment does not necessarily have to be green pills, yellow pills, injection or admission. Treatment starts with counseling and psychotherapy. Treatment comes with ability for you to realize there's a problem wrong with you or there's a problem wrong with your loved one, a colleague, a friend, and help them to seek you know, um, help at that point in time. So first thing is counseling and therapy, and it doesn't have to be with a professional. It can start with trusted, trusted friend. And if for any reason you do not have those people in your circle, then of course, we encourage you to meet professionals that will help you. And of course, even if you have those kind of people in your circle, and you, you know that you, this person needs more professional help, no, please assist them. And if you are the one, please go to meet a professional. Why is the professional you know, recommended? They help you to create that safe space where you can speak up, you can speak out, where you wouldn't be judged, where you wouldn't be criticized, and most importantly, as Nigerians, where you, nobody will be apostolic towards you. And so that safe space is where you can really get help, and they will help you with tools that can help you to stay productive and fruitful. So yeah. with counseling, that way, and then, of course, with medication, if you need medication, that will also be deployed. And if you need admission, that will also be deployed. But the truth is that holistically, studies have shown that people that are dealing with moderate to severe mental health condition, therapy and medication help them to thrive better, not only survive, but thrive and flourish. Interesting. Let, let's come back to the studio quickly. Uh, there are those who would say that how would they identify that they even have issues of mental health? Because you mentioned a whole lot of them earlier on. So if you could just 
walk us through uh, the indicators that show that perhaps a person is going through or getting to that point where he needs a counselor or to address this matter of mental health issues. All right. So um, stress undealt with can lead to a mental health disorder. Stress is not a mental health. I think I mentioned it yes, earlier. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Because a lot of people use that word abusively, especially in this part of the country, Lagos, you know. Um, one in four Lagosians is dealing with mental health issues. So it's very prevalent here. And so a, a guy just comes and says, oh boy, I'm depressed though. No, you're not depressed, you're stressed. Mm -hmm. So you need to watch out for undealt with stress because when there are stressors around and you don't deal with that stress, it could now become a mental health disorder. So when, when you're stressed, okay. be on the lookout. Another thing you should be on the lookout for is when you're withdrawn, mm -hmm. you just find out that you're not relating, there's, there's no social connection, there's a social disconnection. Now look at that woman, a, a certain woman that committed suicide at, at a time, you know, it was discovered from a place of work that she was she not was relating, she right. was withdrawn. So I think we, that's another factor. Okay, we, because of, of our time, we have to leave this conversation here. But we must thank you, Ayodeji Michael Oni, psychotherapist and mental health advocate, as well as uh, uh, mental health advocate, psychiatrist and psychotherapist, Dr. Mimuna Kadri, for your time on the program. Ladies, thank you so much.